Good evening and welcome to the Adam Smith Institute. My name is Matthew Kilcoyne, I'm the Deputy Director here. Um, tonight, we are joined for an extraordinary session of our webinar series um, for something that's a little bit out of the usual. We usually, we look at UK domestic policy, um, but one of the remits of Adam Smith is international trade. Um, and it's one of the areas that I personally take a great interest in. It is my entire um, career, in fact, I started back in um, the 2013 as fresh faced out of university as a trade credit underwriter. And um, before moving on, looking at political risk and then um, the sort of lawyers underwriting market, um, and then going into trade and investment professionally uh, with a with a, um, as an advisor to a um, get evolved government, uh, the government of Catalonia. Um, knowing how uh, how separatists necessarily may think um, and how independence movements may think within a wider context of trying to involve, in, increase investment whilst also suggesting that you're going to introduce constitutional questions. Um, it's something that I really, really enjoy with the sort of on, a, on an academic level, but has very real applicable terms for the United Kingdom as well, with Scotland, um, as well as Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic of Ireland, as well as Wales. Um, in terms of how the UK could evolve or how it could um, end up dismantling itself. Um, so, but tonight though, um, the, the wake of the Brexit vote hasn't led yet to the FPP uh, nightmare scenario of all of the parts of the United Kingdom work walking away from each other, but instead to the UK acting as a singular unit, um, to looking at how it can do deals around the world, that global Britain moniker. Um, but how realistic are these deals? How much opposition are we likely to see faced um, within both within the UK and also externally um, within the UK? Um, and why um, why is it that, that we put so much store by them? Um, and what do they really mean in practice? So we have discussed we're going to be discussing um, the likely first deal that the United Kingdom will sign. Um, the, the country that was the first out of the blocks to congratulate the United Kingdom have, for having left, and the one with the largest uh, number of Brits diaspora currently um, anywhere in the world, which is um, Australia. Uh, although it's the, the further, one of the furthest countries away from the United Kingdom, it has over 1.2 million Brits um, who are living in, in good levels of conditions, in good levels of, of housing, sanitation, um, and often in many respects, better qualities of life um, than, uh, our, than our own here in the United Kingdom. Um, so we're going to be discussing we're going to be discussing this with um, our very own Matthew Lesh, um, who's wearing both his ASI hat as well as his as his um, Institute of Public, uh, of Public Affairs hat um, in the in Australia, um, and also the author of the book Democracy in a Divided Australia. Matt, have I plugged your book well enough there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're muted. You've muted yourself. This is very old. I should be I should be unmuted now. Where has he gone? You are still. You should be able to hear me. There we go. So Matt, um, is it in the they, you wrote today um, for the Telegraph about the visit of the of the Australian Foreign Minister. Um, to the UK. How important is it that, that, that Australia and the UK both get along and also that they seem to be on the same page when it comes to foreign relations? Mm. Look, I, I thank you very much, Matt, for um, hosting the webinar and <laughs> inviting me to come along today uh, as the, the, I guess, the ASI's resident Antipodean. Um, I'm glad as well as the uh, ASI resident millennial that I have a, a house plant next to me um, showing off the out. Um, in terms of the, the foreign ministers, so this is uh, the G7 foreign ministers meeting, which is a, a precursor to um, the, the broader G7 leaders meeting in June. Of course, the G7 being the world's kind of leading industrialized liberal democratic um, economies. And Australia has been invited um, as a guest of the UK, along with other key Indo-Pacific powers, um, including the likes of um, uh, South Korea, India, um, and uh, of course Japan already being in, in the G7. So the, the whole um, point of Australia's invitation, why this is quite significant, is of course Australia's um, relatively 
muscular willingness um, to take on and, and question uh, China's attempt to dominate the Indo-Pacific region. Um, Australia has very much thrown her weight around in the diplomatic world. Australia is kind of classically defined as a, as a middle power, um, but a middle power that attempts to, to punch above her weight when it came to things like asking for an inquiry about the origins of COVID-19 or bringing attention to human rights abuses in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, um, Australia has very much been at the forefront and provided some global leadership. And being at that top table um, uh, today at the, the G7 foreign leaders meeting is, is extremely important for Australia. It's extremely important for the UK as well as a kind of close ally. Um, and as Australia is a, a very close friend of the UK in the region, who's, who's got a lot of understanding of, of the dynamics and has been thinking about this issue um, particularly the rise of China for, for quite some time. Thank you, Matt. Um, so the, we're going to see the rise of China as, as a continuous theme throughout this throughout this segment, because how can you ignore um, one of the largest players of geopolitics? How can you ignore um, someone who's making quite direct threats uh, to many Indo-Pacific partners? Um, but before we do that, we want to examine some of the claim that maybe um, is the Australian government and other have the Western governments um, been able to live up to the promise that they make themselves of open, tolerant societies that look after their citizens. Um, and Latika, you've been working for the Signaling Herald, the Age, here in London, and you've seen actually a lot, a, some a side maybe of the of the Australian government that is not not necessarily told. Um, we know that there have been sort of hostile reactions to migrants to Australia for many decades um, and questions of undertones of, like, of racial bias and so on, and systemic racism, institutional racism. Um, but now we've seen uh, the, the idea that actually, if you're an Australian citizen living abroad, you have very different rights and claims and responsibilities than Australians in, the, in Australia themselves can claim. Um, how level? How much is the level of uh, feeling of like fairness is there? Is there within uh, the Australian communities living abroad um, about how much they are valued as Australians right now? Yeah, I think this is a really important issue, particularly in the context of our relationship, the Australia UK relationship, because. As a diplomat uh, once said to me a couple of years ago, a British diplomat, when I was working in, in Canberra in the lobby or the press gallery, we call it there, he said, what do you think the strength of the UK-Australia relationship is? And um, you know, I kind of hummed and, hummed and ahed and he looked at me and he said, the strength of our relationship is the people to people links. Uh, always has been ever since basically uh, you went into Europe and, and ditched your trading relationship with us and forced us to find new markets, mainly in China. Um, and there are more uh, British people in living in Australia than people from any other country. Uh, the second highest migrant um, overseas intake is from India. So Australia's always been a very proud multicultural society. If you ask any politician, Liberal or Labor, what they think about our multicultural record, they will tell you that we are a successful society. But come the pandemic, that's being really put to the test because what the Australian government did at the outset, which I think was a very good move, was, was move quickly on the borders. They used their island status as their, as their top defence. They closed the borders, uh, not just in, but also out. So no Australian can actually leave the country unless they get an exemption. Now, what this has created is a bit of a problem because for the duration of the year since the pandemic really began, uh, Australia sought to cap the number of people who can come into the country each week because they need to quarantine them in hotels. And so that's led to tens of thousands of Australians being trapped abroad. And uh, the other issue, of course, is that a lot of Australians aren't necessarily trapped. So Matthew and I are a good example of this. We don't necessarily need to get home, but we know we can't. Or that if we had to, in, a, in, a, in an urgent rush, say our family member was sick or something, we'd have to pay tens of thousands of pounds, spend the two weeks in quarantine and pay a further $3,000 for that. Now, Last week, this approach, which enjoys huge public support in Australia, uh, went a real final step, and I think a, a step too far in, in some people's minds, um, in criminalising citizenship. They have actually said that they will jail or fine uh, anyone who comes directly from India. It's been classified as a high-risk country. It's the first country to be classified as high-risk, despite the UK's outbreak and the US's outbreak being very strong over, over the winter here. Uh, and they've, they've made uh, this threat, which is extraordinary. 
and I do think uh, is going to cause a long-term scarring of Australia's relationships uh, abroad and also some kind of underlying concern amongst the international community. I don't think you'll ever get a situation where people will say out loud what they think about what Australia is doing. I think everyone sees that pandemic requires some pretty tough and difficult measures and each country has chosen its own path. But there will be a lingering effect from this. And I think people to people links, uh, one of the bedrocks of this relationship will be one of those things that could suffer. No, I know that I know that Matt Lash definitely has a point about the openness. I've been speaking to him all day about this. So um, and actually for me, it's stuck in the pool that you had the Australian government desperately trying to get um, tennis players coming in for the um, and then you see the total difference and they've been struggling with an outbreak knowing that there's a second wave in Europe happening um, and then still coming in and still putting them in, into quarantine in parts of Australia but normal ordinary Australians or normal Australian um, Indians find themselves effectively, well, not effectively, genuinely outlaws if they come back to Australia at this moment. It seems that there's a level of mismatch and it seems it seems um, resolutely um, inequitable, shall we say. Yeah, yeah it has stuck sorry, in nothing. quite an extraordinary position, which they've done quite well in, let's say, Act 1 of the pandemic, which is stopping the, the virus spread around the country. But then in Act 2, it's really struggling um, in terms of vaccinations, as Latika tweets about quite regularly, um, is currently got eight times fewer than the UK. Um, and then if you think about what the longer term strategy is here, it's not like vaccinations are even the solution, um, at least in the mind of Australian politicians, which is total insanity. Uh, Greg Hunt, the health minister, recently said off the bat, if the whole co country were vaccinated, you couldn't just open the borders. And Arthur Sinodinus, who's a former politician, but also the US ambassador um, from Australia, so that even if the entire um, city of Australia was vaccinated, it, it doesn't really matter. The entire world has to be vaccinated for Australia to reopen her borders. And of course, we know that's going to be many years away. So there's no exit plan here. And then there's just this ongoing restrictiveness. And I think this speaks to a, a broader tension um, in Australian history between this, this kind of sense of, you know, we're an island nation far away. We need to be protected from foreign dangers um, versus the instinct to be open, trading and, and multicultural. Um, and we saw that, we see this in, in Australia's past. Well, in the 19th century, Australia was quite open and prosperous and liberal. Um, in the particular first parts of the 20th century, there's something called the Australian Settlement, which Paul Kelly talks about, this idea of high protectionist, high protectionism, high subsidies, high tariffs, very low immigration, a racist immigration policy under white Australia. And that goes away um, under the, the pressure of its own internal contra contradictions, the um, highly inefficient economy it creates, um, the fact that uh, Australia is becoming a, a banana republic, as uh, Paul Keating famously said, as well as the fact that the UK um, has joined the European economic community. So that leaves, that kind of destroys a key market for Australia. So Australia is forced to be more open and welcoming. And that's really created Australia's modern prosperity is dependent upon those international links of, upon those immigra immigrants. And um, the key sectors of the Australian economy um, in terms of uh, services is dependent on foreign labor and foreign skills or if you think about um, the international tourism sector or the international education sector, all huge parts of the economy that are very much struggling now under the weight of, weight of the, the, the border restrictions and that really seem to have tragically no end in sight. And Latika, what do you, do you think that do you think that that's right there? Is that the, is that the modern Australia that that you recognise, or is there is there some rose tintedness to the neoliberalism that Matt espouses as well? <laughs> I think it's important to say that at the heart of all this, Australia is pursuing a very different scenario in how it deals with coronavirus than most of the rest of the world, and that is an elimination strategy. So it's not as though Australia is fearing one death; they fear one case. They locked down entire cities for days over a single case. And that has led to a real resistance to taking up vaccines because as they see it, they don't need a vaccine that will only mitigate coronavirus when they've done even better and eliminate the virus. So it does really put into um, an interesting tension in the next few years about how it uh, squares what Matthew has been describing there, which was really opening up uh, the economy under Labor and Liberal governments, mind you, uh, and, and then wanting to remain um, an open, prosperous nation. 
Now, I think Australia actually will make the decision to give away a few of those key industries. I think international students won't be hanging around and looking at Australia net much longer. A story I'm writing for the Sydney Morning Herald right now, for instance, is around a, a Pakistani student who's one of thousands who has been trying to get back into Australia for a year. Now, he's in his third year studying business accounting in Melbourne. He's going to apply to Britain to finish that uni course and get a credit. And I think the UK, which had a record uh, number of foreign enrolments this year in its universities, is going to be a big winner from people who might otherwise have gone to Australia. So I think the Australian economy uh, will, the Australian public actually, I think, will make a decision in the short term to sacrifice some of those um, sectors. And the reason why it can do that is because we're enjoying massive iron ore sales to China. So the economy in Australia is going gangbusters. They can all socialise. They've been going out. They've been going to nightclubs. They have the few odd lockdowns in their cities. But for the most part, they've been having a pretty good life, looking at us the last year and thinking they're living in hell. We don't want that horror show. And if this is the price, then it's one I'm willing to pay. The danger for Australia, of course, is in the long term because... We, if, if China, as we were discussing before, does find an alternative uh, source for iron ore, which they haven't right now, but if they were to, that would put Australia in a really vulnerable position that it's not ready to deal with. Of course, uh, Jeremy, you come, you've just started at the um, a brand new think tank, so I'm going to let you tell us all about that for a second. But the ties of China um, poses all sorts of long run issues. For Australia, um, the the the, the um, not only is the level of dependence a question, but the question of the like, whether it's desirable to have a, a country of 1.4 billion people um, so predisposed of, so to, to to a singular contract to a singular supply of iron ore that is not within their sphere of influence. Um, and we know that President Xi has made very large scale moves um, into it's quite mercantilist rhetoric about decoupling. Uh, the Chinese economy from international markets while increasing the reliance of international companies on uh, Chinese domestic production. Um, that will, that's exactly the same for iron ore as it is for any other product. He basically wants to make everybody else's companies dependent on him, um, whilst also not uh, making any companies that in any key uh, industries dependent on anywhere else. It's, the, it's exactly the same economic policy that the Qi dynasty went for all the way back uh, and the Ming dynasty explicitly went for as well. Um, this is like, how are we to be surprised that China has decided to revert to, revert to type, or is this a new era? And how how much of a threat should Australia uh, really take from it? Um, and should we be preparing, as the the Australians seem to suggest in the Times this week, um, for all out war? Yes, it's uh, quite a fascinating situation between um, excuse me between Australia and um, China in terms of trade. They do have a, a fascinating level of interdependence. So, for example, Australia has been extremely robust in terms of, you know, um, putting its foot down over what over some of China's actions. And of course, China goes along and puts down loads of tariffs. But you know, in the long term, it's um, it's debatable as to whether those tariffs are really as harmful as China thinks, because at the end of the day, they need these supplies that they are buying from us from uh, Australia. Um, and we are entering a period of really enhanced um, systematic competition between, you know, uh, the free and open world of UK, Australia, the US, um, several other countries in Asia as well, like Japan and South Korea, and those more hostile revisionist states such as, um, well, China and Russia, for example. And China is is doing the sort of thing it's done previously in history and really, well, like you say, reverting to type and um, attempting to, well, it's effectively attempt, attempting to become the new hegemon in East Asia, which of course, at present, the US still sort of re uh, retains that title, but it's uh, doing its best to change things. And it's not really in the interests of anyone else in, in the region. And that's why you do see a certain amount of solidarity from other Asian states, not just Australia and South Korea and Japan, but also ones like Vietnam and, um, and Indonesia, for example, who are fighting to uh, retain their interests. I mean, I think talk of the, you know, the banging of the drums of war is it's a little bit sensationalist, but you can't discount that as a possibility in the future, because we are we have almost entered what is quite it is a form of Cold War, if not the same as the previous Cold War. You know, by the academic definition of uh, of of um, 
competition between states that takes on quite an aggressive tone. So it's very unclear where things will go, but I think it's right that it's, uh, Australia in particular is being very, very resolute in its moves towards China. Enough. And the, um, the Associated Foreign Press announced last about an hour ago that the um, the European Union had decided to suspend efforts to try and ratify the China investment deal. Um, in many respects, some people see the UK as sort of reverting to type because of its best friends attitude going from the European Union towards um, the old dominions of the imperial uh, past, so the, uh, the, the Kansas nations. Um, and also the Five Eyes nations. That's why the, the, the Americas added in there as well. That's the security relationship. Obviously, New Zealand was in the news this week because, or the last couple of weeks, thanks to a slightly different approach to China, shall we say, than the rest of them in joint statements against on, on um, genocide, on uh, response to Hong Kong, um, and also responses to Taiwan. Uh, do you see... Um, there is a level of optimism for, do you have about the sort of the UK, the strength of the UK Australia relationship that's very different from that of the New Zealand one or that of the Canadian one. Um, what is it that makes it so interestingly that unique? Mm. Well, I mean, Australia is unquestionably one of Britain's closest partners anywhere in the world. I mean, you know, like you said, you've got five powers defense arrangements, five eyes network, and you know, similar to the trade deal as well. Um, so I think when all is said in political terms, there aren't many countries with which Britain has deeper ties than Australia. And the geopolitical situation in Asia in particular, is going to keep driving the two countries together alongside other countries. New Zealand is a very interesting case because um, I think to an extent it was sensationalized in the media, but really if you look, if you look at who, who really promoted those comments made by the New Zealand foreign minister, it does seem to have been a bit of an attempt by the Chinese to manipulate the, um, the Kiwi position and really make them seem quite alienated amongst their allies. Now, New Zealand's not really done much to uh, help that. You know, they've, they've kind of kept digging the hole that uh, they put themselves in. But I think we don't have to be very careful about, or Britain and Australia in particular, about not seeming like we're we, we want to control New Zealand's foreign policy. At the end of the day, New Zealand is an independent country, which, uh, you know, they do have the right to do what they want. But we do have to make it quite clear to them the sort of country that they are happily dealing with um, you know, what is going on in that country and what it wants to do to the free and open international order that we all prosper from. And um, it's, this is a really interesting question that come up. It's not a question that's come in. It's more of a statement from Catherine McBride, who, who's um, uh, for the um, Institute back on He said, I've just come back from Australia, and as an Australian citizen, I had to prove that I was ordinarily resident in the UK, and I had to sign a form saying that I would not need to return and that I would not need consular assistance outside of Australia. So any citizen who's returned to travel to India would have to sign the same forms and will have trouble returning. Um, Matthew James Wallace, you've, you've, just, uh, you've just actually just paid a small fortune, I believe, for the privilege of uh, being able to have indefinite leave to remain here in the United Kingdom because we put, we put the strange privilege on, on the benefit of the, of, the, of, the, of the ability to be in the UK and paying the UK tax man lots and lots of money. Um, do you see that as a, as, a, as a privilege? Do you see that as a right? Or is this something that actually Britain has made rather rudely very expensive to people who um, quite often see the UK as being literally kith and kin? Um, and is there a way in which actually we could maybe use an FTA, uh, maybe use a, you know, a new renewed relationship post-Brexit to start removing the barriers between, between friends and family? Yeah, so, so before the Home Office... Uh, you know, oh, Matt, the other Matt. I'm sending, I'm sending this the other Matt's Oh, way. the other Matt. <laughs> there are three Matt's on this call, uh, which is definitely diversity. <laughs> and we unmuted him. Three white men named Matthew. It's uh, definitely diverse, but it's, um, it's great to be here. And I think it's something I would have really been interested in, even if I wasn't... Um, involved because Australia's never felt so far away. Um, and to answer your question, Max, there's been some really great points tonight. I think it, it really does go back probably to Maastricht. And I think it's it's one of those things where um, because immigration became such a big issue and such a hot potato, it has fallen to uh, the Commonwealth uh, and places that were previously more accessible to have to pick up the slack. Um, should I bore everyone with my story? Oh no, please do. 
Please do. It was, it was what made me uh, made me go, you are an amazing person for your for <laughs> particular role, because it's not just, you know, your actual roles and so on and so forth, but it's the the level to which we forget about the creative industry. We forget about the people's people live. So we forget about like what real costs are involved uh, and how much it hinders the things that we say that we actually love about life. Um, yeah. yeah, and the and the opportunities that are open to us now that, um, as has just been said, by doing FTAs and things. So um, I spent the first 25 years of my life in Australia um, working at Sydney Opera House um, when Mother England called at the age of 25. I'm 36 now, so it's been a long process. Um, I'm a performer and wanted to be a small, um, like I wanted to be a small fish in a big pond rather than a bigger fish in a small pond. Um, so without sounding like um, I'm on a councillor's couch, um, I came on the youth mobility scheme originally in 2010. Um, that's only 244 pounds, so not too bad. Um, but there is now an NHS surcharge applied to that, more on that later. Um, I then had a civil partnership, met someone here, which was fantastic, um, but uh, just to, go on about a different visa, uh, there's currently an £18,600 um, minimum income uh, for the partner. So uh, my partner is needs to earn £18,600 um, or I can't stay. Um, that became a big deal, um, obviously, at the time. Uh, we broke up. Uh, when I applied for, um, for that visa, the Home Office had such a backlog uh, that I was without my passport for nine months. So we can bring in the issue with sort of the, the huge amount of procedural work that uh, having the Commonwealth have to apply for these visas creates. Um, so yeah, just to, to go on a bit, um, basically um, at the end of two years after we'd split up, I basically um, moved back to Australia because I wasn't able to come in on that visa. So I've started on this creative path, which is tier one exceptional promise. Um, that's quite subjective, obviously. Um, exceptional promise. So I had to get a letter on letterhead from an organisation that I contribute to the cultural life of the UK, uh, press clippings. I was luckily able to submit reviews from being in shows here. And I had done a postgraduate at the Royal Academy of Music for £13,800. So um, that had so certainly gone into your economy. Um, the endorsement fee was £456 uh, for me to pay to Arts Council England. Um, the visa was only £152, but then we get to the NHS surcharge, which is £3,120 for five years to use the NHS. Um, so that's, um, we're now five, five years later, but obviously if you've only gone to the dentist once a year for five years, that was an, an expensive uh, thing at £3,000. And is, of course the NHS is the envy of the world, Matt and Latika. Everybody loves it. It's a great thing and the Australians famously rave about it in Clapham. Uh, but we have a reciprocal healthcare agreement with uh, Medicare. So uh, I already am meant to get free healthcare uh, through the reciprocal healthcare agreement. So um, <laughs> I've managed to avoid the NHS surcharge on most of my visas. So I've been very lucky. But just for anyone out there who is applying for a visa now, it's moved to £624 a year. Um, the reason you got in contact with me, Matt, was this week I've submitted my application for indefinite leave to remain, which is an exciting time. Um, because I had to start another visa five years ago, I'm on a new path as a creative, um, which costs £2,389. Um, the biometrics are an extra £19.20, but compulsory. Um, last time I applied for the visa, the Home Office had my passport for nine months. And like um, Matthew and Latika said, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't feel trapped here. I haven't tried to go home but I haven't seen my family in two years. And, and if something happens, I wanna have my passport to go. So I've paid for the priority service, which will give it to me in one or two days, but that's an extra 800 pounds. And then the appointment to submit the documents is an extra 138 pounds, two pounds if you want an SMS to let you know that they've actually submitted it after the appointment. Um, so um, that basically gets me to a meeting on the 22nd of May. Not sure yet if I'm gonna be able to stay, but for anyone um, doing a tally, I think it's ended up about 8,000 400 pounds um so to fund it you may wish to take the government's advice and retrain in cyber but if you do um you then won't be granted indefinite leave to remain because you need to prove that you're still working in the same industry yeah it's certainly changed the way in which like australians are um coming to the uk there are now more australians in new york than there are in london uh because there are separate visa categories to go to the us and it's much easier so the, the e3 visa uh, for Australians going to America. Um, and that means that you still have young Australians coming over on a bit of a chance, making it, going to bars and working up 
uh, like entry level jobs up through and give, basically still having access to the American dream. Um, the UK uh, decided to follow Theresa May's hostile environment um, on a non discriminatory basis, so long as you weren't European. Um, and this seems a very sort of strange way to treat your best mates, um, especially if you're, you're, you're these are the people who you share all if, uh, data and security uh, information with in the Five Eyes relationship. You're allied explicitly with in, in terms of the, uh, the five powers relationship um how do we how on earth do we get away with this in terms of like we portray ourselves as being these best friends but we are also screwing each other's citizens um and the, and let's be honest also the, the hell head of state are, is literally the same head of state that's that's um, always been my thought yeah i mean like i i it, it really is i think because the young idea of the young australian working in the pub was replaced with Europeans, and that's because obviously you had freedom of movement. Um, and I think no one on this call would object to the right to stay for anybody who was already residing here at the end of the transition period. Um, but was there the same outcry after Maastricht for Commonwealth citizens? Um, because you know there is an opportunity here to sort of go back to that Kansas relationship. Um, it must be reciprocal, of course, and um, I don't think, and Matthew was just talking about the sort of racist policies that have been around Australia. I don't think that Australia would really approve of freedom of movement, um, but you know, it really isn't acceptable to be discriminating against non-EU countries in, in the fact that anyone who's stayed here uh, after five years from Europe gets it for free, and yet it's costing me so much. Mm. And Robert, yeah, Eagleton just put in a message saying, can we talk about trade? This actually is trade because people to people link a people to people links are important trade uh, that's exactly the building block of all trade it's uh, adding value between individuals and exchange uh, but most importantly it's actually a genuine part of the wto uh remit the what's known as mode four services the ability to move between professionals which be between also students who have offers um and so another 40 section does count within that train. Uh, so I, it's one of the things that I actually get sort of like this, my bugbear is the uh, inability of people uh, to, to move between. Um, Latika, what is the, like for, for, from your point of view, the other parts of the UK's new trade remit, um, having left the European Union, having the ability to um, look at trade itself, that we, like, we are no longer just looking at goods when we're negotiating trade, which is what the EU a lot of the time was doing because it was a, you know, it was a, it, it didn't finish its financial markets, you know, capital markets union didn't finish its digital, uh, you know, singular um, market. So it wasn't able to negotiate for the, for its whole members on the outside. Um, that, and that actually put the UK at a disadvantage because our economy was much more based on uh, services trade on on financial services. And so on. And so we were always, uh, our comparative advantage was, was put to one side whilst Australia's was very much put, uh, sorry, whilst Germany's was put much more in the center of negotiations, necessarily, um, because of us, because we actually didn't complete the markets ourselves. Um, but the UK can now have a chance to work with the likes of Australia who have done deals on the things that we care about, on investment, on uh, financial services, trade on digital, on data transfers, with New Zealand, but also with Singapore and so on, our other, our other um, strong Commonwealth states, with respect for the rule of law and international arbitration. And um, what can we learn from Australia? Um, and why and why are we having what we've seen in the past couple of weeks, which is quite um, like strident antagonisms between Australia and the UK, in public at least, in the papers at least, um, and rather than being genuinely good friends, is this just us, like what is the, is this just um, play, or is there a bit more to it in terms of the actual fundamental differences behind the UK and Australian positions? I think that's a really good point, Matt. And I think I would also say, drawing on some of the other conversations we've had so far, is that Australia and the UK must never take this relationship for granted. And there's a couple of reasons and examples that have occurred in the last few months that we can look at. So New Zealand, Australia. New Zealand's noises about the Five Eyes expanding beyond its remit when it's confronting China with just statements, mind you. There's actually been no action. Uh, New Zealand has opted out of making critical statements on China over Hong Kong, for example. Now, the fact that New Zealand doesn't want to be there uh, and is now almost reproaching Australia and its bigger friends um, for, for expanding beyond its remit shows that you actually can't take these alliances or friendships that are so close, they're like family. 
you can't take them for granted because there are vulnerabilities. And I think what happened a couple of weeks ago when Dan Tien, our new trade minister, was coming over for talk to Liz Truss, your trade secretary, there was this uh, incendiary briefing put out in the Telegraph that Tien was inexperienced and that Liz Truss was going to make him sit in this uncomfortable chair in the Locarno room in the Foreign Office for nine hours. Now, of course, we can all read between the lines and see that that was a bit of a faux pas and perhaps a juvenile briefing from Truss's office. But that had real implications for a little moment there. The Australians were making it very clear to the British that Dan Tien, who, mind you, helped negotiate Australia's free trade deal with the Bush administration and is very experienced and is a former diplomat, um, would happily stay in Europe for a couple more days and not come to London and not work on that deal. Now, as things uh, transpired, the relationship was good enough that Liz Trust could call Dan Tien, apologise for it, and things were fine. Now, that trade deal, I think, we'll see at the G7. I think uh, it will be pretty good on some skilled visas and harmonising of qualifications you're not going to see freedom of movement ever between Australia and Britain. That is a dream that you can lay to rest as you go to sleep tonight because it's just never going to happen. And as for the cost of visas, the British will rightly point out that Australia imposed those high costs first. So it's very right for us, I think, to complain. And I'm going through the exact same issue that Matthew's going through uh, to get my indefinite leave to remain this year. It is very expensive, but Australia is very expensive for the British too. But, but, but Matthew Lesh, why should the average Australian or the average Brit accept the low, the low level and hostile positions that our governments have taken to migrants for the past two decades, rather than the actual liberal approach that we know is very, very, very popular between our two countries, at least? And shouldn't you start, like, and the question about whether you have non-discrimination or discrimination in terms of how you treat the rest of the world, as well as how you treat your, like, your best friend, um, the UK, of course, has free movement with, with Ireland, no matter what happens because of the Common Travel Agreement. Um, you have the Trans-Tasman Agreement. Um, what's stopping uh, the UK and Australia? Is it just that imperial legacy? Is it just that you don't want to be seen to be hold like, but, you know, like, is, it that, is, is there something there? Or is, it, or is it something just because Australia is so much more hostile to migration now than it was 30 years ago when the Trans-Tasman Agreement was first done? So, I think there's a few um, elements for hesitation. Uh, I mean, you've got to remember that the fees largely came in in the first place because Theresa May wanted to make the governments fewer than 100,000 gold, but of course couldn't do anything about EU migration. And um, that issue has kind of uh, obviously disappeared now um, and the UK can, can limit migration or, or control migration or be generous about migration in, in whatever way she so chooses. Um, I've recently paid for a, a, a five-year visa and gone through the thousands of pounds of NHS fees and um, uh, visa costs and, and whatever else. And then I'll, of course, have to do that again if I want to definitely remain. It's, it's this is cost. Matt's reminder for me to pay that invoice, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm being very subtle here. Um, <laughs> no, so this is an ongoing, an ongoing issue. Um, in terms of um, free movement and what Amy's talking about, so the, I think this hesitation yeah, on, on the UK side um, I suppose in that respect that we didn't just take control of our borders in order to um, limit control, even if, as you say, Matt, there is quite high levels of popularity for free movement. Um, on the Australian side, that history of a discriminatory immigration system is something that um, looms large, and Australia is very proud of the fact that it, it, it claims to have a, a non-discriminatory immigration system. And of course, it discriminates in other ways, um, based on skills or income, whatever else it may be. Um, I think there, there will be, um, if not free movement, um, I would expect some kind of free ur movement <laughs> um, in, in the forthcoming uh, UK-Australia deal um, in that respect as, as one of the, the kind of easy wins, in a sense, from that agreement. And I'm hoping that that does look at um, the issue when it comes to fees, because it really has made it that kind of um, starting out two-year visa is really inaccessible for a lot of young people, particularly if you're not going to set up in a professional job paying thousands of pounds uh, potentially um, that, it, that it adds up to in order to come over here and um, just doesn't really work out, let alone the fact that it's, it's very difficult and, and not that appealing in the middle of a pandemic. In the longer run, I think that issue is um, going to continue. Uh, what I think is going to be interesting, though, is trying to also deal with some of the kind of complex trade issues going on here. Um, it, it seems like the, the number one issue remains agriculture. Um, and, and Matt, you're probably going to be able to speak to that uh, much better than I can. But there's a, a very much a fear within um, the, the, the British agriculture industry and, and led by the NFU 
that Australia will be um, effectively selling lower quality, sorry, lower price, higher quality produce into the UK market and competing on those terms um, would not be particularly happy for what is largely kind of small scale British farmers versus bigger scale Australian farmers. Now they make a bunch of claims about standards that are, are very complex and, and largely very easily debunkable. Um, but I, I think that's gonna remain the, the kind of political sticking point about signing a deal. Now it doesn't mean that there isn't about to be a deal, but I think that's gonna be the, the final issue that needs to be resolved. And it's probably gonna take loggerheads at, at the highest of levels to, to try to fix. Because Australia doesn't wanna sign a trade zone which doesn't actually get any market access for something like agriculture. And I think as, as uh, residents in the UK, we should want more access to British agriculture, um, to Australian agriculture. And that would be good for the quality of food and, and the price of food in this country. Quality of food. I like that, Matthew. You are always on a mission to try and improve the quality of British food because somebody has to do it. It's a one-man job. It's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a thankless task, Matt. No, mm. but, um, but the no, it does have like, actually, I mean, it was something. BBC Country File two weeks ago hosted during the middle, just after Prince Philip had um, passed away, um, a effectively a twenty-minute rant about Australian agriculture and how. Um, the, the cattle in Australia were not deemed to be of high enough quality for a, a British, good British honest cattle farming. Um, forgetting, of course, that the UK, that the, the rest of the world does actually remember, you know, the both the BSE crisis, uh, foot and mouth, and on top of that, you know, things like uh, the UK's um, uh, horse meat in lasagna, uh, like beef lasagna. Scandal. So the question about sort of like whether the standards are equivalent, whether they're held um, are just as much, and also, you know, the organizations like PETA, uh, the vegan organization would say that most animals are treated pretty appallingly. They're just talking about fact, degrees of, 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 of tolerance here. Um, and it's really about like how much you trust consumers to have that kind of approach themselves. Like if you're basically what you're saying when you say, well, we're not allowing uh, Australian beef in is that you're not giving people a free choice um, to care about the same things that you care about, which is you know the income that you're willing to provide to Welsh farmers uh, for lamb or for uh, beef up in in Anglesey or in the Highlands, um, and that's and that's a very different. And like your question there is like whether you are forcing priorities onto a people that are free choice. Then is that something? And also, are you getting value for taxpayers? I think, Jeremy, your previous job at the Taxpayers Alliance uh, was constantly looking actually at ways in which um, the UK could get better value for taxpayers. Australia was very much founded on getting more value out of that, literally for British taxpayers. Um, and and you know, and a new start in the new world. Does that does it stick in the craw, frankly, that you're then told that no, this country is can offer nothing of value uh, by farmers that are trying to cut out competition? It's it's quite incomprehensible, really. I mean, I'm from the countryside myself, so I'm admittedly quite sympathetic to the British farmers that you know I grew up alongside. But um, there's you know there's a lot there's got quite high food costs in the UK, and they're increasing very frequently. And I think with the the increase of budget supermarkets i'm not sure the quality is necessarily always rising alongside them um so like you say i think there's a lot to gain from uh, free trade with australia and to be fair new zealand in terms of you know more more meat imports particular lamb from new zealand i suppose yeah there's a lot there's a lot to improve certainly and Latika, do you think that this is like we, we quite often like is is SPS what we're going to get stuck on because it's the one thing that everybody gets stuck on in most trade deals. So it's like I can imagine, and it's what the EU got stuck on, and it's why the Northern Irish Protocol gets stuck on. And um, and can the UK reasonably expect to get like get done the U, the Australia deal when we still don't really know what's getting on with the protocol? Uh, so we don't know what level of benefit a Northern Ireland could get, but also what it would do internally if we had different SPS regimes, so different, uh, not just potential, but genuinely different SPS regimes from that of Europe. Yeah, I think um, ag is always the emotional sticking point in everyone's trading negotiations. It's been the same for us when we did the America deal, same with us when we've done uh, better deals in Asia. And it's certainly proving to be a similar point here. But I would just like to make one point about beef imports in particular. So uh, Britain always runs this red herring that we're about to flood your market with um, cheap crap uh, Aussie beef um, that has been raised under a lower standard. But actually, uh, the Australian imports that go into Europe are separate feedlot suppliers. So actually, the supply line 
is dedicated, it's completely separate to meat that we might sell to China or feed for ourselves, and it adheres to those EU standards already. And for that reason, we've actually not shipped a huge amount of beef to Europe. But under the, uh, when you were in Europe, um, most of that quota actually did end up going to Britain. And the reason why British uh, consumers like Australian meat is because the time it's taken to get here actually helps it age better. So Aussie meat arrives in a pretty good condition. Now, I think that uh, if, if the British want to quibble about something like that, they've not got a leg to stand on. And also keep an eye out for sugar and things like that, because Australia will be wanting a lot more access on some of these agricultural products that are not necessarily the emotional ones for Britain, but are actually for Australia and, and sugar is one of those. So there are some sticking points, but look, I think there's every degree of confidence that this deal is all but a signed deal and we will see it. Uh, unveiled at the G7 when Scott Morrison, Australia's Prime Minister, flies here for that leaders' meeting. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a pretty high chance of that, Latika. We had um, basically a bidding war at the beginning of the year, whether it was going to be New Zealand, whether it was going to be Australia. Quite often, a geopolitically, Jeremy, I think you might agree, but the trade deals are given as kind of rewards uh, for being friends, um, and New Zealand is not going to be rewarded. Uh, I think it's fair to say for some of the positions, or at least the seen positions that um, that they've taken over over China and the the major geopolitical issue that is um, Hong Kong um, and Taiwan. So, um, but I wonder as well for Matthew, the, going back to those to the sort of the industries that are sometimes forgotten, the level of complementarity that Latika was just talking about there, that Australian beef actually arrives and it's ready to go, but like we also benefit from. English being the common language. Um, sometimes the, the time zone is seen as a massive friction between trade, but actually when you're doing a legal contract, and we used to deal this in insurance, we'd leave it with the guys in Singapore, and then we'd go and we'd go home to, for, to bed for the evening, and then we'd arrive back at eight o'clock in the morning, and it'd be done and ready. Uh, so it'd be like, you, you actually, that time zone was a benefit to us. Um, is there a, is there a similar complementarity that exists between like you know the ability a, the the the, the theatre and music and entertainment industry all have the same sort of foundational styles all have the same kind of like training and expectations um, and also all the links with one another um, and are, are we not are we taking advantage of those enough um, or or are we uh, or are they a bit sort of subsidised in each other's countries and forgotten about the international links and what they benefit. Uh, well, I mean, I, I agree with you, and I think it's it's one of those things where you know my training in Sydney was the same as uh, Royal Academy of Music here, and uh, certainly when they cast these big musicals, so uh, all the Cameron Mackintosh stuff that's on in Asia, usually half the cast comes from Australia and half the cast comes from the UK, and they meet in the middle. And I think um, you know uh, there's been comments in the chat about about trade, and I think you know ultimately this is about trade because um, we're stifling economic ability by putting all these hurdles uh, onto some people and not the others. So what I would like to see is a sort of test case. Um, I, I don't have the money for it, but, um, you, you know, realising whether we could offer settled status to, to Australians, you know, because Matthew's just said if he wants to stay indefinitely to remain, you know, 2389, but for someone else is free, you know, granted settled status is only 65, it was, was going to be 65, but is, is only a digital status. Um, but maybe that's something that could be offered to, to creatives to, to sort of help that side of things. I suppose the, the, the part of that that we were talking about, you know, you're getting the same training. Um, it's realistically, a lot of regulation is always about trying to get the same outcome. You want your you want the food that you're eating to be to not kill you. You want the clothes that you're wearing not to combust into flames. Um, and we try and trust our regulators as like as people. Um, very like we want them. We think that they're doing good. And often, a lot of the sort of implicit the assumption that the citizen takes is that they. That the regulator doesn't want to make things too difficult for businesses to operate, um, but they want people to live as good a life as possible. What is it about sort of the trading blocks and the frictions that exist between between different governments that means that we don't trust friendly states like Australia, like America, like Canada and Japan um, with the with trusting like, that they're doing right by their own people, so they're probably going to do right by yours as well. Um, in terms of those healthcare systems, is it like a level of patronization, or is this just like is it just a way of, like the lobbies have used to try and cut out competition? Um, and they, I'll use that to all of you, but like 
Um, are there any sort of extreme examples you've heard of, of Australians here in the UK that have struggled to get on, on, on something that they've been trained to for at home? Because um, I remember, Matthew, when we first met, that uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce told us that nurses had to come and retrain here in the UK. They have to do a year's worth of retraining um, in mm. the UK because, you know, British veins were totally different from Australian veins. Uh, maybe the blood flowed a different way down the, down the, <laughs> down the body. Yeah, nurses is a, is a pretty good example of it. I, I've um, had some, some friends who have uh, been over in the UK for a year or two, they've trained and qualified as nurses in Australia, but they haven't actually bothered retraining in the UK because that, that process will take um, many months and it's quite expensive and they've quite frankly already have the skills and they don't feel a need to retrain. As a result, they actually can't practice in the UK. They can't um, work for the NHS and, and serve British patients over, over that time period. And it just creates this huge unnecessary burden. And that's um, something, again, that, that can be fixed in a, a trade deal is this mutual recognition of qualifications. Um, and I hope we, we do see some good news on that front. Um, and quite frankly, the, 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 the <laughs> Boris, um, when he uh, you know, um, went through quite a, a near death experience, um, spoke of two nurses who treated him. Um, Lewis from, from Portugal, I think it was uh, Julia from New Zealand. And, uh, of course, they, they both um, you know, helped save his life. Uh, one of them had to go through a, a training course um, and one of them didn't. And, and that, quite frankly, is something that's um, not fair and, and not necessary. And it's, the, and it's the native English speaker in a country I, whose I, medical system was set up. In, and using, he uses the same textbooks, does the same training. It's, it's of an equal or higher or you know, same quality um, and completely doesn't make any sense to have this retraining. Mm. No, Lutika, actually, journalism is one of those industries that quite often is seen as like you don't need, so long as you've got a good eye for a story, you can get on. But it's a highly unionized uh, um, workforce with lots of lots of actual good, like huge legal and like liabilities um, as well. And quite a lot of training that happens behind the scenes. Um, do, are there frictions there as well? There's like frictions between coming from Australia, from like ABC or, you know, S um, SMH and coming to work for at the UK, either as a freelancer or as a paid up? Um. Not really. I mean, I did a university degree for my um, journalism training and I can hand on heart tell you, I learned nothing at uni about how to be a journalist. Everything I learned about being a journalist was taught to me by other journalists, news editors and, and very, um, you know, good wise elders in the industry, basically. A lot of it is learning as you go and a lot of it's your gut instinct. But in terms of, qualifications or hurdles for my industry, not so many. But Matthew Lesh is exactly right. There are huge complications for, for the medical professional. So I think the legal profession, and that is certainly something everybody will be will be wanting to see progress on in the FTA. I mean, it's an absolute no brainer. If you consider the international exchanges that we do and also between our universities, there's no reason why these qualifications shouldn't be recognized. We've got a question here from Eamon Butler. He always gets to ask a question. He's our, our director and founder. And it's one that I'm sure did to many of your hearts. Would say, in taking on China's use of trade barriers in the attempt to close down criticism, what Australian wines does the panel think that we British should be drinking more of? <laughs> Best recommendation, guys, please. <laughs> Um, I've become recently obsessed with uh, a winery by the name of 10 Minutes by Tractor, which is in the <laughs> Peninsula is my, my home state. Lizzie, were you going to say the same? I was going to say the no. same. I love 10 Minutes by Tractor, although I'm not a recent discoverer of this. Um, I've Ooh. known it for years and years and years. <laughs> it's one of the best. If you can get your hands on a bottle of Pinot Noir from the, from the, the 2015 Friday. estate Pinot Noir is my personal favourite. Yeah, because right. in the Australian wine in the UK is basically known as for Chardonnay, right? It's white Chardonnay from New South Wales. Actually, what you've it's got to, known for Shiraz, actually. What, what you've got to remember is if you see a bottle of wine um, at an M&S or a Tesco or whatever that, that says wine of southeastern Australia, that's the proper dregs. That's not the quality product. That's been shipped over in, in mass um, vats, basically, and bottled in the UK. Um, snob, uh, if, snob. You've, got, you've got to find the wine that has a, a local um, uh, bottling in Australia or a, a local tag to it rather than something that's been um, is perhaps the, um, the, the undercuts of the, the Australian market. 
I can actually give you a great, um, great recommendation if your if your lovely audience would like it. But I recently wrote a great story about how, of course, China um, blocking imports of Australian wine, what that might mean for our British and European customers. And there's actually a great uh, company down in Kent that specialises in, in importing boutique Australian wine. It's called the Venorium. It's fantastic. And I have been buying so much wine from there ever since. And as Matthew says, it is none of that mass produced vat dregs that you never want to go near, trust me. I'm going to close with that, Matthew, as well. You, you must have a good, like, you must have a good supply. Come on. Oh well, I, I'm a Sydney cider, so it's more the hunter for me. And yeah. um, I, I, I certainly uh, one of my favourite vineyards there is Tempest Two. I um, mean, I saw I saw Michael Crawford sing there, flying in on a helicopter. So that might have something to do with it. But um, it, they, they do. It's it's the different blends. So you know, steer away from your Chardonnays and go for more like a, a Vidello, something like that. Fair enough. I like that. My father, by the way, used to have a have a role in the um, mass importation and bottling of plant, of uh, Australian wine. So I will defend to the hilts the right to Britons to have a three pound bottle of wine from Australia rather than a, a two, having to spend five pound on a bottle of plonk from France. Uh, we were, so your your farmers help us, you know, help the ordinary Brit get on and have their night big night out on a Friday. So I'm, I'm all, I'll I'll continue to fight for their right to do that. Um, if we get the Morgan Schonderbar asks us, what can the UK learn about Australia's relations with China? A bit more of a grown-up understanding of Chinese a Chinese power play. Um, is that is there anything to learn, Latika, for the for the UK from your point of view? Yeah, I mean, look, I think Australia is um, at the front front line of dealing with China's interference in its democracy. Let's hopefully, let's hope there's not a front line. Otherwise, I'm going to today war sign in the background, I think. <laughs> well, I, I think on that point, actually, I know we had a bit of that discussion earlier, but I think we also need to maybe redefine what we term as war. I think we're deep in the midst of a very strong competition war right now, and democracy is at stake, and Australia realised this very early on. I think Britain belatedly now understands what's happening is probably a little still reluctant to do what is required. But I think in a couple of sentences, the main thing that the West can learn or Britain can learn from Australia is we need to do it together. So if one country is picked off by China, as we are seeing perhaps with New Zealand in the Five Eyes, it creates huge vulnerabilities. China doesn't have alliances, we do, that's our strength. And we have to do these things together so that China cannot pick off us as individuals. And Jeremy, I wonder, just before we finish, I'm going to give you some of the last word of this, but the UK, the long run of history, the reason why the Chinese went for the Belt and Road Initiative is because China has been isolated historically for the, from the lack of the, the, the trade relationships that it's had for the past few hundred years. A very aggressive, antagonistic, and very much um, sort of frictioned basis of dealing with all their neighbours at once isn't going to change that, is it? Whereas the UK's re-engagement with India, in fact, like part of that with the Australias as well as America as well, um, linking up um, uh, India as part of the Western alliance, effectively, is a very long run um, sort of engagement process for the, for, the, for the Western states. But it's one that fits within the sort of like the, the containment strategy for, Indi for China as well. Um, does, how does the, how do the UK and Australia use that with other parts of the world and like how do we end up so that we end up without you know it's like um with both of our aims of both a pluralistic open tolerant and liberal world um where that we are actually not sidelined by the likes of china but actually we're leading an international coalition of um, prosperous states well i think china did um it did used to have quite a good press for bni but it has been reversed quite a lot in the past couple of years certainly um, I think the, the UK and Australia, and also has to work with other countries, largely in the OECD, but a bit more reluctance from some of the European states. Um, uh, they just have to work to keep funneling investment into these countries so that they don't really need to uh, become so plugged into Chinese debts and end up in situations like in Ceylon or I think I think Karachi, um, where they're essentially China is ending up owning swathes of cities. Uh, so is the UK. Australia, et cetera, et cetera, the Five Eyes in general, she to keep being really active and using things like international development is actually something they can use quite effectively in this way to not really use it in such a broadly philanthropic way as has been used in the past, but really being more targeted with it. 
because ultimately these countries that will that will uh, take these BNI projects they're not these projects won't work for them in the long term so we do need to be prepared to you know spend a little bit of money and get some investment into these countries or at least help direct investment from the private sector into these countries yeah and i think that's final final point i'll stick it in but the the, the, quite a lot of when we were saying that regulators face exactly the same challenges, we're all facing a low, several le, several layers of global challenge. Whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, you know how we're going to feed a growing population, um, how we're going to use scarce resources, um, and part of the sort of benefits of globalization is about having as many people as possible in their in their own ways, having ability to input into that, and knowing that not everybody, not one single person, can know all the things in an economy and all the moving parts all at once. Um, and that the, the benefit, therefore, of all of human beings having the ability and agency and, the, and, and also resource uh, in order to, to, to make the best for themselves gives an aggregate better response for the whole of society. So there's a genuine good, uh, you know, huge debate being had about whether, you know, a monolithic um, state-led economy in the Chinese, in the Chinese system um, can deal with these kind of challenges. Um, and... Or whether, like climate change and so on, or whether actually the ingenuity of the sort of free market system, um, getting individuals involved, enterprise and innovation um, are at the heart of it. And India and America and the, and the UK getting back together in terms of uh, long run uh, support for innovation and entrepreneurship, I think bodes well, much better for, for and Australia, therefore, a part of that too. Um, and it's that, that kind of forward-looking relationship that is about people-to-people -people links. So those people-to-people -people links that we were talking about in both the creative industry and about financial services and about legal services, all of it plays very nicely into one another. Um, and so on that lovely bombshell, and it's like actually we are going to help save the world, but in our own small way, um, and often to our own benefit. Uh, but thank you very much for all of you joining us at home, and also thank you to Matthew, Matthew, Jeremy, and Latika for, for, for yours. I, Latika, I, I realise I kept you beyond time, you're off for dinner, I have to let you go. Uh, thank you so much, um, and good evening, and we'll see you next week.